everyone and welcome into Gamecock Gateway, the brand new podcast from Gamecock Central. Uh, I'm Colin Taylor, staff writer, uh, covering football, basketball, baseball, everything under the sun. Uh, joined by um, Gamecock Central intern and staff writer Justin Hall. Justin, how you doing today, man? Doing well. Always good to talk football after a win, talk a little basketball after a win. We're getting everything today, right? Mm, absolutely. It's, it's that time of year where literally everything's going on. Um, some days I wake up and I'm not sure where I am, uh, just based on the, <laughs> where I've been the night before. So, um, yeah, no, that could, go, from, that could go one of two ways. Yeah, no. Oh yeah, no, trust me. It's, I'm, I'm always the, the way that some people might think it. I'm always, I'm always good with that, but, um, going from Spartanburg to Columbia to Conway in a few days to, uh, wherever this team ends up in a bowl game. So it's a lot of miles on the car. So it's a lot of fun though. Um, we're here to the, the starting up this podcast to kind of give you guys an idea of you know different things that go on um at games uh we include interviews with a few um former players a few guys that you know played at south carolina hopefully we're going to work in some media members um that's our goal uh but just to kind of give you an all-around encompassing look at south carolina's uh kind of past uh, present and future so that's kind of the, the point of this podcast uh thanks for listening um but you know we're starting this for you guys um and hopefully this this goes well, and you guys enjoy it. Um, I know Justin and I have talked about this for a while, um, and we really wanted to kind of put something fun and interesting out there. That way, everyone can kind of uh, enjoy it. It kind of gives a little um, I wouldn't say lightness, but a, a fun aspect to football season, um, which can get kind of stressful for some people. Trust us, we read your posts on the message boards and different things like that. So you guys are you guys are great. That's like, that was fun. Y'all are fun. Yeah, so we, we want to give you guys kind of a light, um, interesting look at things and kind of have some fun, uh, lighthearted interviews and uh, make this kind of a fun podcast for everybody. Um, so that being said, um, if you have any kind of requests or opinions, we'd love to hear them. Uh, we can always take positive criticism. Uh, so if, if you have anything, uh, not positive criticism, constructive criticism, if you, know, if you have positive <laughs> things to say, don't, don't, don't hesitate. Um, but, uh, if you, if you have any ideas or anything like that, you know, email us, tweet us, anything like that. Um, so with that being said, let's dive right into Florida. Um, they got closer than most people thought. Um, but South Carolina came out with a win and our seven wins heading into the final two games of the year. Justin, what do you think of yesterday's, uh, back and forth noon game? Yeah. Uh, a back and forth noon game that with the time change, we were, it was still dark when I left. Um, you know, for the most part, I thought South Carolina really controlled the game more than a 28-20 to 20 score would indicate. Um, running the ball extremely well behind an offensive line that I've mentioned several times in the pregame Q&As on Facebook Live that, you know, having those offensive linemen shift and shuffle be due to injury will help you down the stretch, and trust me, it's done that. A.J. Turner had a fantastic game. I thought for the most part, South Carolina played – kind of the game we thought they would and Florida seemed uninterested for much of four quarters just like we thought they would so unfortunate for Florida to fall this far but South Carolina getting that seventh win just just to see the joy on the faces of these players and coach Muschamp after the game you don't see that a lot during the year this was a special game for them even if they won't say it right and you know it, it was when you think of noon games in college football this I mean perfectly sums up what a noon game in college football is um, it seemed like it took a little while for the players to kind of wake up. Um, there were a few. It, it got weird really quick. Um, it was like some of the the players were, you know, or not players, but, you know, the game itself was drinking mimosas in the parking lot before the game. You had a, a, a pick six that turned into a 25-yard gain for South Carolina um, because they picked it off and fumbled going into the end zone. You had Hayden Hurst, you, you know, catching this, like, circus catch from Jake Bentley. At one point, I mean, it was it was insane. And, you know, you obviously mentioned A.J. Turner having a good game. Uh, he seems to rattle those off once every, like, three weeks. He'll go for, you know, 130 yards. Um, but, yeah, and then Mon Denson played really well, too. So he's a guy that's kind of come on this year when his number's been called. So um, hopefully, you know, that's good signs for the Gamecocks if they can run the ball. And it's kind of been statistically proven if, you know, aside from the NC State game, if they can run the ball, they win um, for the most part, and that's that's a huge thing for this team, uh, establishing the run and establishing it early. Um, and I think they did that Saturday. Um, and you know, Jake Bentley did not play his best game by any stretch of the imagination, 
um, but he found ways to get the job done. He had two rushing touchdowns. But uh, what did you think of the way Jake played this past week? I thought it was erratic, and I told you this when we were watching the game from the press box. I said it just seems like he's taking a really long time to make his decisions. And he said a lot of those post game were due to it was the, the plays were just slow developing. And it would take a while to hit them, and I, I don't know if I totally believe him in that. I feel like he, you know, he second guessed himself a lot during the game. The wheel route that turned into an interception, he had Hurst open from the word go, where he could have fired that out at any time. And he waited and he waited and he waited, and didn't see the safety come over. Erratic and not his best game. Three turnovers, but he completed sixty seven percent of his passes. Mm-hmm. So. It's kind of a balancing act for him. Not your best game, but when it's not your best game and you win, you can kind of move on quicker. And he joked after the game that you know it's it's easier to learn after a win than after a loss. Is that you can kind of build on things a lot better after a win. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think Jake had a an erratic day. Um, there was one pass that it, it actually got Brian Edwards hurt for a play or two. Um, Brian was coming over the middle and. Jake was kind of late hitting the, the check down route and led him right into a, a defender who, who hit him pretty well. And Brian Edwards had to come out of the game for a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was just a, you know, it, the weird thing about Jake is he always, you know, Bentley has these weird kind of plays where he'll go and, you know, he'll start slow or he'll be overthrowing receivers. And by the time you look down at the stat sheet, he's, you know, 21 for 27 for 175 yards and a touchdown and you're like how in the world did that happen because he started off you know one for seven or you know one for five for 20 yards or you know 10 Mm -hmm. yards or whatever it is but um he's you I feel like aside from yesterday you kind of know what you're getting out of him which is a guy that's going to you know make a few big throws here or there but um in all in all aside from yesterday's you know picks protect the ball um, make a play with his feet if he needs to, which he did yesterday, and um, you know move on f- from there and you know manage the game really well, which I think he's you know really matured in this year in, in terms of game management. And and you know that that defense too. Uh, just want to get your thoughts on this, but that defense yesterday absolutely mauled whoever was in at quarterback for for Florida. I mean those guys. I mean you could tell from the opening series for Florida is that they were just going to rush up the field and, you know, lay as many hits as they could on him. And, um, I mean, whether it was Malik Zaire or, you know, Felipe Franks who came in for Zaire who was hurt, you know, they just did not look comfortable whatsoever in the pocket. No, at all. And what was interesting um, just to see, I, I felt like they played with a different attitude and a different mindset than they have even when you had – you know, players of old with Clownies or Ingrams or Swearingers, like those guys played with attitude, but there was a carefree attitude to this game yesterday that, I mean, players are, are, are dancing on the field before the snaps and on change of possessions, and they probably got that from the Jets a little bit, but at the same time, they just literally, I don't remember a single pass play where Florida dropped back, whether it was Zaire or Felipe Franks, where there wasn't pressure. It, it was it blew my mind in a couple of busted coverages, but for the most part, I thought the defensive line just played out of their mind yesterday, just flying everywhere. Yeah, and I mean, you saw it with Taylor Stallworth, who had five quarterback hurries yesterday officially on the uh, the stat sheet, and he, you know, it just seemed like if if you didn't see who was rushing, you kind of assumed it was him, and um, that was, I mean, it was very much so. I mean, he he was back there constantly, and it was a guy that you didn't know that he was going to play till Thursday. Uh, and he just kind of came out there and said, you know, this is my game. I'm going to take it over. And he did. Um, and based on the post-game press conference, he was pretty happy with his performance. Um, he got to joke around a little bit with Javon Kinlaw, who uh, I'm going to put them in the terms of, you know, need their own show or stand up special uh, because those two guys are absolutely hilarious. That was uh, the greatest post-game press conference of all time. And, you know, for for the listeners, I don't know if you've seen it or listened to it or anything like that, but those guys are hilarious. Uh, Javon Kinlaw compared himself to a chihuahua. It's um, great. Biggest chihuahua in the world. Yeah. If that's a chihuahua, I'm terrified to see what a German Shepherd looks like to him or something <laughs> like that. Uh, and you know, Taylor Stallworth joked that, you know, every time he sees Javon Kinlaw running free to a, a, a you know, offensive player that, you know, they better start calling the ambulance. Because you know I've never been hit by a, a six foot six, three hundred pound defensive lineman in the SEC uh, running full speed, but I can't imagine it feels great. Um, 
and you know, those guys just the, you can tell they get along um, and they play you know right next to each other um, and you know they're practice together but Taylor Stallworth had a great game Javon Kinlaw had a great game uh, DJ Wanham seems like he always has a great game and then uh, you know the, the rest of the t- defense kind of fell in behind it um, played a lot of man coverage because the defensive line was rushing so well um, they could blitz and um you know the defensively you know you look at 20 points but i don't think it was as close as the score really indicated and south carolina kind of kept them around not and didn't really deliver a, a knockout blow at all on saturday you know it's 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 kind of weird i want you to take on it too but you know you know south carolina has been in a lot of close games and in recent years if if a few years ago this team was playing the schedule i don't think they would have seven wins like this team does and it no. always seems like they're able to kind of pull out these late games. You know, you look at NC State, Tennessee, um, Vanderbilt for some aspects of it. In Florida, they've been able to kind of come up with a late interception or a late play um, to kind of seal the victory for them. Right. I think I think the last time you saw that was North Carolina in 2015, right, one of three wins that year. You didn't see it at all in 2014 when they gave up double-digit leads multiple times that season in what was one of the most – physically and mentally exhausting seasons as a fan I've ever had. But this team, I don't know. I Fans don't like it, and I get it. Listen, it would have been a much better game for Carolina in terms of aspect to go, you know what, up 21-6, to six, make it 28-6, to six, and stretch it. Um, but this team tends to find themselves down the stretch. I don't want to say conservative play calling in the fourth quarter. I don't want to go that far. Um, so I think sometimes it's warranted. Um, but just the offense tends to not be able to find ways to move the ball, which leaves it up to that defense. And But the defense seems to thrive on making that last stop. Um, you think about what they had just given up. They had just given up a long throw, which was close to a touchdown, but they ended up giving up that almost touchdown. The, uh, I think that was the one that Florida tackled its own players. Florida tackled its own players, which is crazy. It's almost like the time when they blocked their own players, but we won't go there. Right, and um, – be- that was about as perfectly summed up Florida season as, as it could. That and the pick six where they fumbled into the end zone that gets returned out to the South Carolina 25, but that's neither here nor there. Right, it's neither here nor there. We, we won't, Both of those things are very Florida, very Randy Shannon-esque, um, but um, I think for the, for the most part, what we're seeing from this Carolina team is they're just going to – Gene Chizik mentioned it on SEC Now. I actually got home at a decent hour and was able to watch that this morning. Um South Carolina is just finding ways to win, and that may be the best way to put it. South Carolina is just hanging around and finding a way to get it done in the end. And listen, whatever the formula is, you're seven and three, right? And you finish five and three in conference, and you're probably going to finish with sole possession of second place. I, I don't know what more you could want out of this season. When going in, a lot of people said six and six would be a good year. Right, and I, I mean, heading into the season, if, you know, I mean, in Canada, I, I was thinking anywhere from five to seven wins is probably that the, the threshold for this team with so much unknown on defense. Uh, but the defense has surprised me week in and week out. Is it, you know, a, a defense that, you know, yards statistically not, they don't put an emphasis on, but they put an emphasis on turnovers, put an emphasis on yards per play, put an emphasis on, you know, red zone defense, which you've seen, I mean, time in and time out this season. Just look at the Tennessee game. Uh, and, you know, I think they have a shot at nine wins in the regular season. Um, and even if they split the next two games, you beat Wofford and they're at, you know, beat Wofford and lose to Clemson, which um, I can see happening. I can also see 2-0 and o down the stretch, too. Um, I, you know, I think... Eight and four is a is a great mark for Muschamp in his second year. Um and it's something that you can build on in terms of recruiting, in terms of positive momentum um, in the media, and in terms of all that other extracurricular stuff. Um, and, you know, I think eight wins is it's it's the most um, since winning 11 in 2013, the last 11-win season. And so that's that's something to hang your hat on, is you can definitely see an upward trajectory for, for this team, um, what are we now, 10 games into the season. Yeah, and 10 games in, and you're talking eight and four, one of us here predicted eight and four before the year, 
if you followed me on Twitter, you would know that I believe it was me. And even I was just like, this is pie in the sky. This is if everything falls the way it should. Um, and we won't talk about – I don't like to use the term – well, they could be 9-1 and one right now. Well, no, no, they couldn't be because they lost those games, period. Mm-hmm. You can't go back and change those. And um, two, they could also be, you know – Lose Six. to Louisiana Tech, lose to Brit, lose to Vanderbilt. Yeah, yeah. There, there are a few games that could have gone the other way too. But you know, we get, the, the point still stands is that they had a shot in all both of their losses. They had a shot in, or all three of their losses really. They've had some shots in. Right, and so for for Will Muschamp to finish this season, more than likely he's going to finish the regular season with eight wins. Right, I mean, right. unless something catastrophic happens against the Terriers on Saturday, mm-hmm. it just you move in the right direction and now you have teams that are usually beasts on your division Tennessee and Florida who are dumpster fires at this point Tennessee firing Butch Jones um, that, that's a that's a big deal and that's going to change recruiting a lot with some very notable guys um, that we cover on Gamecock Central quite regularly you saw so, one of them today already saw one of them today you're going to see more coming down the pipe I'm telling you it, it, the tide is changing away from Tennessee a little bit and, and it can move in Carolina's way because you go eight and four, nine and three, and you go, okay, this is legitimate proof on the field that we are improving each and every week and each and every year. Recruits want to see that. And so then you can go into next year, solid recruiting class, coming off of an eight and four season. That will tell you Carolina's got something, and going into next year could be a legitimate threat for the for the title game. And you know, you look and George has got. I, mean, I think Georgia is going to be a force to reckon with for the next few of years. Course. South Carolina is probably right there with them in terms of um, where they are as a program. They may be a, a few, a little bit behind just because George, you know, Kirby Smart inherited a lot of older players on his team. <laughs> um, and, you know, you don't get handed, you know, Sonny Michelle and Nick Chubb and not succeed at least a little bit at first. Um, but, you know, I think South Carolina and Georgia are going to be the two kind of teams competing. Um, over the next, you know, three, four years potentially in, you know, the SEC East, which is, you know, great for Will Muschamp, who, you know, has, you know, if I, if memory serves, has, has uh, won an SEC East before um, and kind of knows what to, to do in that situation. And I think he's learned a lot from his time at Florida and then as a defensive coordinator at Auburn uh, before coming to South Carolina. And I think he's using a lot of that to his advantage right now, um, you know, trying to navigate South Carolina into what could be um, a big few years for this program in terms of upward trajectory. But, you know, moving on now to, to kind of the more fun aspects, but, you know, we're going to hand out a few game balls. So, um, Justin, if you want to go with your three, and then I'll finish up with my three. Okay, I hope I don't steal any of yours, but I think I'm going to steal one. So oh, let, all right. Let's try this out. Game game ball number one. I, I think I may shock some people. I'm going to give this one to Taylor Stallworth. Not the whole defensive line. I won't. I won't go easy way out. I'll just say Taylor Stallworth. And here's why. Um, injured against Georgia, comes back for his first action, um, getting on the field. We knew Thursday he would go, but you know how how good is he going to be? No practice this week. Um, will he be able to make the plays he needs to? Um, according to Pro Football Focus, he had seven total quarterback pressures two stops and one batted pass and you know how that one batted pass went I think that was the one that actually got intercepted at the end so my first game ball goes to Taylor Stallworth senior defensive lineman what about you sir um yeah so my my first one I'll I'll kind of stay along the defensive line and give it to Javon Kinlaw um just because of you, you don't really think of guys that big as being versatile but he is. Uh, he's a guy that can clog up the middle, but also can make plays in space. And, and you've seen that a little bit already this year. Um, but you know, he's he's a guy that's played really well, and he's coming into his own. Um, you can kind of see the light bulb coming on for him, um, and that's a big thing for him. So I think he deserves uh, a little bit of recognition already um, for his play, not just this week, but last week too against uh, Georgia. And uh, you're. Uh, I'll concede and let you get the uh, first crack at the second game ball as well. I'll go. I'll go with Mon Denson for my second game ball. AJ Turner's too easy. I'm telling. You, I don't take the easy way out, folks. Understand? I take the road less traveled. Mon Denson, who, to be honest with you, I loved coming out of high school. I loved his tape as a recruit. Finishes with 19 carries, uh, or excuse me, 13 carries for 61 yards on Saturday. Um, 
just an excellent performance. First two career touchdowns, and the first one, he ran it right up the middle, and I'm telling you, he didn't get touched at all. And he ran right to the middle of that defensive line. Um, just a good day for Mon Denson, taking advantage. Um, Tyson Williams just, you know, hasn't captured the coach's attention really with his play other than running the football. He doesn't pass protect very well. Um, so Mon Denson stepped up with Rico out and Tyson not getting the carries. Mon Denson has filled that hole very well and is pretty much the reason South Carolina won that game yesterday. Uh, this this I have my third one, so I hope you don't take the third one. Um, I'm saving okay. saving this guy for the end. Um, but you know the the second one gets a little bit harder. I'm probably gonna go Hayden Hurst, um, just because you know again he's he's versatile. He had 59 yards receiving. Um, didn't lead the team though. Or Trey Smith led the team, but uh, he had a couple big passes. Um, he was downfield blocking on a lot of times, and he's inching closer and closer to that all-time tight end receiving record. Uh, at South Carolina, he already has the receptions, um, and he's a guy that I think is going to be sorely missed whenever he does decide to go to the NFL, um, whenever that might be, if that's after this year um, or after his, his senior season. But my second game ball goes to Hayden, um, plays really well. Uh, still haven't decided on a nickname yet. Uh, I've heard Big Red, uh, the, the official account, put out, um, I want to say Garnet Thor, yeah, so, Garnet. That's a good one. That's it, sneaky good. It's a good. Um, but I think I think we need something more streamlined. Um, so yeah. we we're gonna have to find out a new nickname for Hayden Hurst over the next few weeks before we get into the bowl game because uh he might he might get some new nicknames over the next few days or weeks uh, depends. Uh, but that's my second one. What about you for your for your last one? Game ball, and I, I know we're going with yours. Game ball uh, number three goes to the Carolina fans. Um, listen, noon kick, and it was downright cold yesterday, or Saturday. It was cold. Um, noon, I didn't know how the crowd was going to be, and they almost filled the place up. I mean, it was almost completely completely packed. A few seats along the top that weren't filled. That's just because the wind was going to be too bad. Those guys decided not to come. It was loud. Um, fans were into it. When the players started dancing, hint, hint, um, you know, the fans rallied around that and got into it, and they enjoyed it. So a noon kick against an SEC East opponent that's down. I know it's still Florida, but still a chance for you to take a week, maybe two off with Wofford before coming out for Clemson. Uh, proud of Carolina's fans for showing up and supporting a team um, that is overachieving and just vastly blowing everyone away and is quietly 7-3. and three. So hats off to the Carolina fans for, for showing up and showing out on Saturday. Um, yeah, and you kind of know where I'm going to go with my last one here, but – no uh, giving it to uh, DJ A minor, um, <laughs> who uh, not only got the fans involved, um, got the players involved, and got one specific media member involved in um, the <laughs> <laughs> in-game hype music. Uh, he played one of the greatest songs of all time, Nuck If You Buck, three times. Uh, and <laughs> on all three possessions that he played it, Florida failed to score. Um, Keep that so, in mind for the game. What? Keep that in mind for the Clemson game. You'll yeah, see that so, again. So um, the the stats don't lie. Uh, per ESPN's next gen next gen stats, uh, South <laughs> Carolina sh should be undefeated every time Nuck if you Buck is played. Uh, which, and you know he he other than other than the the crime mob crew uh, anthem to um, squaring up as the kids say. Uh, he he did. Play some great music. Um, got the fans involved. Uh, Run DMC made an appearance. Um, I'm telling you, it's it's tricky. It's never a bad choice when it's yeah. tricky. He's getting played, and college kids like us who weren't alive when it came out are dancing around to it. Man, that's that's sneaky good stuff. Yeah, I saw a dab somewhere in there during it's tricky, which um, <laughs> molding of two cultures, uh, yeah. bringing bringing together of the old and the young. Um, and uh, at one point he did a uh, Biggie Smalls um, instrumental. So uh, we're we're in uh, a new stratosphere in terms of music. Band also played pretty well. Um, so it was it was a lot of fun. The atmosphere, even for a new game, was pretty great uh, in terms of music and different things like that. Um, so yeah. With that being said, let's. Uh, do you want to go ahead and hop into our interview with uh, Eric Kimry? Absolutely. You guys you guys are gonna have a great time with this one. Eric was. 
Coach Kimry was really fun to talk to. Um, enjoy doing PA for those guys on Friday nights. Mm -hmm. uh, wishing them luck in the state championship game this week because when this was recorded, it was game day, and they ended up going out and just shellacking Porter Gal. Final score of 42 to 14. So hope you guys enjoy this. There's there's some great stuff in here. Yeah, and uh, Eric was great. You know, he talked a lot about um, that one pass that Carolina fans remember him for the fade. Um, the what? The, yeah, exactly. Uh, and he, he went into a little bit of his playing days, uh, shared some five point stories with us, and um, talked some about you know Mush Champ and different things that he learned uh, from Coach Holtz, from his dad, um, and different things. So we hope you enjoy. Here's uh, Eric Henry. Um, so, Coach, just kind of talk about the season so far and kind of what stood out to you and kind of just overall your, your impressions of your season so far. Well, we're 10-0, so it's yeah. a pretty good impression. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, these guys have been a joy to coach, uh, great kids, intelligent kids. Um, as an offensive play caller, it really helps when you got a guy that can distribute the ball the way Corbett Glick has for us. Uh, I think he, you know, if he does what he's supposed to do, hopefully tonight and uh, and throughout the rest of the, the playoffs, he'll – throw for over 3,000 yards, and um, Lucas Prickett's been a great target for him, a 6'5 kid that could play in college, but may go want to be a doctor or something like that instead. <laughs> um, so on offense, we've been able to distribute the ball. Uh, Andre Wilson's a young um, playmaker that we think has Division One potential if he grows a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then defensively, we've got some seniors inside linebackers, Isaac Michael and Henry Locke, but they're behind these two monsters, uh, sophomores that are our huge recruits, um, um, Boogie Huntley, Alex Huntley, just got offered by Georgia not long ago. Also been offered by South Carolina. We think he'll he'll blow up and his recruiting will blow up this spring. Uh, and then Jordan Birch, uh, who's 6'6", 250 pound defensive end, also can play point guard in basketball. So this kid's just a – he's a freak athlete and, um, and a great kid. And really, uh, he moved into Columbia this past summer, has assimilated well into Hammond, doing well in the classroom, and, and seems to be enjoyed by the entire community. Um, and I know we as coaches really enjoy him because <laughs> he's, yeah. he's a really good football player. Such a good athlete, we'll put him at tailback sometimes too and get in the eye, which I've never done before. Yeah. But I've also not had a 6'6", 250-pound kid that can run the way he does. Sure. So. Yeah. It makes it easy to call off. It does. <laughs> so it's been a fun year. Um, listen, we, we, we want to end the year well. Uh, we're in a new season now with the playoffs, and, and hopefully we can do that. When you, when you go back to last year, not winning a state championship, which is very different for Hammond, was there an added – motivation of this season did that play in at all with these guys or were you just like new season we'll start over from scratch that means nothing last year was that any added motivation yeah that was that's kind of been our mo even when we when we've won championships you know i mean what happened last year happened last year and this year's a different process altogether um and i think you can't look into the past as, a, as an external motivator i think it's got to be within it's got to be the present um we talk about a process a lot people use that word a lot everyone has a different process but Fundamentally, as a coach, what we have to do is get our kids to buy into the here and now and what they can do in this present moment to improve themselves and how we can buy into into the you know that moment. So uh, we didn't talk about it a whole lot. Um, I don't think we talked about it at all. Um, but what we talked about is, hey, it's Tuesday, it's two days, and it's hot, yeah. and no one wants to be here, but we have to be here. Let's get better. So um, uh, the, the guys have done a beautiful job this year of, of taking each day seriously and trying to get better. And you talked about Jordan Birch, he's six six, and he's a sophomore, by the way. Yeah, he just turned sixteen. Yeah, and he's six foot six. So when, I, when I've seen him, he reminds me a lot of a guy who wore number seven for Carolina in high school. Is there any sort of? Can you look at him and go, yeah, there's some similarities between him and Clowney, just in terms of their athleticism at that age? Well, and I, how you I, use didn't, him. I didn't see Clowney as a sophomore. Mm -hmm. Now, our one of our assistant coaches, Jay Fry, who mm -hmm. coached at Richmond Northeast for a long time as the head coach, played against Clowney. And he said that there's a, a large amount of similarities. He thinks that Jordan might be a little bit more athletic, that uh, Jadavian maybe been had a little bit more of a burst at that age. Um, but, you know, I know that coaches from Clemson and other schools have, have, have made those comparisons. So um, you look at the kid and you look at his athleticism, and I've never seen anything like it. I've never coached anything like mm -hmm. it, of course. And, you know, and, and Jay Fry says this is kind of a once-in-a-lifetime type of player um so i don't think you can underestimate the kid's ceiling yeah. he's also a remarkable basketball player he will get a lot of division one offers in basketball as well it'll be top 15 20 in the state in basketball so 
Um, I don't know, and I know the kid loves basketball as well. I think he he understands that his ceiling is probably even higher in football. Right. But who knows? He he's just 16 years old. He even <laughs> well, grows yeah. three or four more inches. It may be that he can go play basketball mm-hmm. somewhere. But we just want him to be a um, successful student here at Hammond. And I, as a coach, want to guide him and let him know he's going to have a lot of opportunities in, in both sports. And what he decides to do and what is in his heart is is up to him. You obviously start in the playoffs. You know this next few weeks hopefully if you guys keep winning is that a playoff beard or is that something you no this is grow? just an old man beard man. It's, uh, <laughs> lazy. Yeah, it's, no, no it's not lazy it's just like you know I don't have any hair so you need some cranium accessories yeah, so keep so, a little warmth on the yeah side that's right cool. so you know embrace that kind of scotirish hair so yeah. heritage I have so there you go have you uh, encouraged players to grow playoff beards well you know they can't grow beards in Hammond really okay. yeah yeah, they, they so. make them shave them, unfortunately. So yeah. they get the, your, your beard is the only one they get to marvel at? Right, all, us faculty members. Yeah. So, and there's not a lot to marvel about it. But, you know, it is there. Yeah. So That's what's, that's what's important. You talk about the old man beards. We're going to go back a little bit. You've been at Hammond now for 13, 14 years? This is my 14th season. Yeah. 14th season. How many and how many state championships is it in that stretch, I believe? We've played for 10 and we've won 8. Yeah, that's, so. a, that's a good winning percentage. Yeah, I would say so. That's a good winning <laughs> percentage. Yeah, so we go back. Run. We go back to before Hammond. The year before you were at Hammond, you were a GA at Carolina. But then, of course, play at Carolina, quarterback. Um, well, most, signaled mostly. But, most notably but, yeah. known for one specific throw. I don't right? know what you're talking about. I, 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 <laughs> in case anyone doesn't know, it was Mississippi State, right, I believe, in 2000, right. right? So the documentary just came out on the fade. Yes. Uh, how interesting was it to see yourself after you do the interviews and then see yourself on that documentary on TV? Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's a range of emotions. Number one, it's, it's embarrassing a little bit. It's like, what do you do with the information? What do you do when someone comes to you and says, I want to make a documentary about your life? It's just like, you just, I guess you say, okay. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't something that I was you know, thinking about or set out to do. But when, when that opportunity came up and Les Carroll, who did a great job with the documentary, approached me about it, you know, we had a few conversations and felt like it'd be a cool thing to do. And, I, and again, he did a great job with it. But it's different. It's weird, you know. Um, it's great that people remember that moment for what it was because it was a significant moment in, in Gamecock history. But at the same time, I wish that they would have you know, been able to highlight that season itself because there were some great stories in that season. Number one, the turnaround from 0-11 to 8-4. and um, I think the story of Phil Petty and the year that he had that year of Ryan Brewer coming from Ohio and winning the Outback Bowl and beating Ohio State and John Cooper getting fired the next day. Um, you know, just so many great stories of, of that season that, you know, I wish would have been told, not just mine. Right. Well, I mean, that's a significant throw, though, and it's a yeah. significant moment for a lot of Carolina fans. Mm-hmm. There there are some moments that they talk about. Mm-hmm. And growing up here, they talk about the push-off against Clemson, and then they talk oh, about the don't talk about it. I won't talk no, about no. it, but you get those moments like that, and I don't know if we're going to have a Rudy moment, you know, where they create mm-hmm. a whole multi-million dollar movie about you. At least no, you didn't jump off I'm not, the, uh, my friends say I have a face for radio. So. There you go. Well, th- we're working that out. Yeah, then. that's good. So, uh, no, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a special year, and, I, and I, there was a significance to that year, coming from really mediocrity for so long, hitting rock bottom. My first game, we won against Ball State, and then we lost 10 in a row, and they fired Brad Scott. And then the next year, we lost, you know, 11 in a row, I'll tell you a funny story. We were, uh, we just lost to Vanderbilt by one point, mm-hmm. and, um, and we had Florida and Clemson left to play. So it was inevitable that we were going 0-11. Right. And uh, Coach Holtz walks into the locker room after the game and said, Brad Scott deserves a trophy this damn big for winning one game with your sorry asses. And he walked out. So um, anyway, that, that was a true story. And, and Coach Holtz could be cruel and witty at the same time. But uh, <laughs> that was a challenging year. Uh, Needless to say, but to go on that next year and, and to win that first game, and the, I mean, it was so funny. We were embarrassed to take our uniform or our, our, our gear down to five points. Like you wouldn't wear your Carolina football shirts. Now, granted, they weren't those sweet Under Armour shirts. Mm-hmm. They were like Russell Athletic. It was like the yeah. blend. It was yeah. awful, but uh, <laughs> you still wouldn't wear it because you had lost twenty one games in a row. Yeah. Well, when they, we beat New Mexico State, they ripped the goalpost down and literally put them up in five points. I mean, imagine that scenario today. Mm-hmm. Where the students will rip down the goalposts, walk them from Williams Rice Stadium down to five points, and put them up in the fountain. Okay, like there were some crazy stories that happened. So that was a fun night. And then the next week, Georgia comes into town with Quincy Carter, and he was a Heisman Trophy candidate. And um, and he threw five picks, and we win twenty-one to ten. They rip them down again, back to five points. Two weeks in a row now. Okay, mm-hmm. we played Eastern Michigan. We beat them. No goalposts, but we're three and zero. 
Then Mississippi State comes into town, and they were ranked 25th in the country. They just played for the SEC championship the year before. They were a legit program, and we were losing the whole game. And, uh, and so it was just a really crazy moment to come in on that fourth down and, and to be in that situation. And uh, after the game, I really, they wanted to rip him down again. But the cops were like, listen, enough's <laughs> enough, guys. Like, we don't want to to for new how many big moments can you have in one <laughs> season? Know. So, uh, yeah, that was a special year. What, what were those nights like after you beat you know, New Mexico and you beat Georgia? What were the, the nights? And they were fun is what they were. So <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah. Yeah. No, you know it was great? It was, I remember after the Georgia win, all of us got together, all the guys. We, and we started at somebody's house, you know. And, of course, you're college kids, so everyone's sitting around drinking beers mm-hmm. and, and things like that. But it didn't matter, you know, white guys, black guys, poor guys, guys from came from more affluent families. It didn't matter. We were just teammates. Right. And we just went out and hung out together. And I'd be sitting next to Brian Scott or Derek Watson or Jamel Kelly and Ryan Brewer and Phil Petty. It didn't matter. We all had different backgrounds, but we were a team. Mm-hmm. And it was so cool. And we went out together. We decided as a team we were going to go out together. Now, from there, you had your <laughs> fragmentation, so yeah. to speak. But uh, uh, one, one of my favorite stories was after the – Mississippi State game, me and Rod Trafford, I don't know if you remember Rod, but he caught the game-winning touchdown against Alabama in 2001, Mm -hmm. and we did the similar thing after that game, but he lived on Tavern on the Green on Green Street, Rod did, in an apartment up there, and he got to know the bartender, this guy named John down there, and so we're hanging out at Jungle Gyms back in the day, so we would go there because we knew some bartenders, and they would give us free beers, so we're hanging out at Jungle Gyms, and Rod, who's from New Jersey, is like, Kimberly, we got to go up to go see John, let's go see John. So I was like, all right, let's go see John. So we go up there, and Tavern on the Green's packed. I mean, there's got to be 150, 200 people just slammed in there. And we come in, and John sees me and Rod Trafford, and he cuts the music. He cuts the music, cut the music, cut the music. He makes us stand on the bar and plays 2001 and makes us take a shot in front of the entire <laughs> – and everybody's just going nuts. And it was just like this wow. Like, it was such a crazy <laughs> moment. But uh, – I'll never forget that. And when Rod caught the game-winning touchdown against Alabama, we went and did the same thing. The same thing happened. So some fun moments down in five points after those those games. Just and, a few, right? Yeah, yeah, just a few. That's right. That, that's the only ones we'll mention. Um, <laughs> you get, so you you move on from Carolina. You're a GA in, in 03, and then you come to Hammond. Since that time, you, you, Lou runs his course here, and then he, he leaves after 04. Um, and then Steve Spurrier comes in. Uh, Talk about where the program was when you were recruited and came with Brad Scott to then where it was about 06, 07 with Steve, mm-hmm. and then now where it is with Will Muschamp in 2017. How night and day is it from, from 98 well, to now? It's very different. I think times have changed, too. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think there's definitely been a progression, but with some significant bumps in the road. Some necessary, maybe some unnecessary, but... You know, I know that after we went 9-3 and three against uh, uh, the second consecutive Outback Bowl mm-hmm. in 2002, um, you know, it was a time that really if Coach Holtz would have left, Skip would have taken over the program. And I think we, would have, we wouldn't have had the dip in progression that we had his last couple of years, and even maybe Steve's first few years, where there was just those 5-6, five 5-7, and 6-6, six, 7-5 and seven, six and six, seven and five type of years. Um, we had some great coaches on staff there, and it had been interesting to see – what would have happened had Skip been able to take over then and there? Um, and, I, and I have a lot of respect for Skip Holtz, and I think he would have done a good job. And that continuity could have served us well. You look at Clemson and the, the, the changeover from Bowden to Dabo. You know, it wasn't instant success, but that consistency was huge and paid dividends in time. So, I mean, I'm not saying – I'm not here to say that we shouldn't have hired Steve Spurrier over Skip at that point in time, of course. What I'm saying is it would have been interesting to see had – Coach Holtz walked after that 9-3 and three year, and we would have maintained that consistency what would have happened to the health of the program. Um, but I definitely think Coach Holtz left it in a better place than he found it, but not in as good a place as he could have left it. You know, you had the brawl in 2004, and, um, you know, and that was a shame. And, and honestly, you know, I think Coach probably – it's tough. Listen, I'm a coach. And one day, you know, they're either going to fire me or I'm going to have to figure out when I want to walk. Right. And it's not easy to understand when it's time to walk, especially when you've had the success of a Lou Holtz or Steve Spurrier. Uh, it's rare that you have your Tom Osborne's. It's more frequent right. that you're Bobby Bowden, the most successful coach in history, and they run you out of town. Mm-hmm. So I get it. It's a difficult decision to make. I feel like both Coach Holtz and Coach Spurrier left a couple years too late. But I do think Coach Spurrier – uh, inherited a healthier program than Coach Holtz did. I do think it took him a while 
to, you know, to get it to the level that he got it to. And you have to always credit Steve Spurrier for what he did in those three 11 win years and, and um, the success we had under him. Um, there was definitely a national presence to our program that wasn't there before. Um, so I, I credit Coach Spurrier a lot. I think we all know when it started to fall apart. I think when Ellis Johnson left, and I think when um, uh, Shane Beamer and Brad Lawing left, and then uh, we promoted Lenz, Lorenzo Ward and some of the people he brought in, um, I think that there was clearly a negligence in recruiting that we're still feeling from today. And, you know, you, you saw a really quick downslide uh, when it comes to the health of the program. Um, and so uh, those last couple of years of Coach Spurrier's um, error here, six and six and three and nine, were again indicators that he probably stayed a little bit too long. And I think he wanted to leave a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, but so I think that the program, uh, not to get too long-winded, but the program that Coach Muschamp inherited uh, was definitely not in a healthy place at all. Sure. And he's had to overcome a lot. Um, and, and our talent um, whole is is significant still to this day. We don't have the depth that we used to have or even the five-star type talent that we have. You look at the NFL today, I mean, Swearinger, Clowney, Ingram, you name it, man, they're everywhere. Um, and we got some guys on that team, but maybe not the depth of those kind of guys. But I think uh, the job that Will Muschamp's done has just been amazing. And he's exactly the kind of guy that we needed. Really, we had two celebrity older coaches that their celebrity status probably benefited our program um, because of the TV exposure and then the success that, you know, they both had in their own rights. Uh, it, it highlighted the, the greatness of Columbia and the university and what and the, and the potential that we have there. But then it ran its course. And so I think fundamentally, um, you know, Coach Muschamp is, is having to dig out of a hole. you got to observe a program – you know, kind of close being in town, but you know, you're a coach in, in the same community. Just kind of take me through the process of you deciding coaching is what you wanted to do and kind of, you know, your progression as a coach and you trying to mature, um, kind of maybe on the job and learning as you go as a head coach. Yeah, I mean, I was just around the game my whole life, even mm -hmm. as a kid. So my father is a coach. Um, I just grew up kind of being around the game. I remember my earliest memories of coaching were my younger brothers and coming up with like no huddle kind of offenses when I was 10 years old. And so, uh, um, anyway, the game's just kind of always been in my blood. I, I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. I almost went to the Naval Academy. My mother's an engineer. I thought about being a lawyer. I thought about being an engineer. Um, and But I just really enjoyed the game of football. I think it really changed for me. I was a redshirt freshman. I was the seventh-string quarterback <laughs> running the scout team. And, you know, I think Coach Holtz had said like two sentences to me. Yeah. I think one the first thing he said to me was uh, I was throwing a deep ball, um, and I just – overthrew the receiver by like five or six yards. This was a terrible pass. He goes, hey, Kimberly, you want to run 40 yards for nothing? And I said, no, sir. And he said, no, I'm going to throw the damn receiver. <laughs> um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, um, but he came up to me midway through that year, and I guess he'd been watching me interact on the scout team. I tried to take some leadership on the scout team. Mm -hmm. And he just said, Eric, you know, what do you want to do when you're done? And I said, well, I want to get into coaching. And he said, well, do you want to coach high school or college? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, if you want to coach college, you come see me. I have a job for you. And uh, and he so he offered me a job when I was a redshirt freshman and the last string quarterback. And that's when I was like, okay, maybe I ought to think through this whole coaching thing <laughs> yeah. a little bit more. And to his word, he, he hired me. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a great relationship with Skip. And I think that those years at Carolina were really formative for me. Um, I learned what I would do. I learned some of what I wouldn't do. And had a great opportunity to, to learn that year as a graduate assistant. Um, and then Phil Petty actually was here as the offensive coordinator, and Ryan Brewer was here. And they were just finishing up school while I was a GA, and they just wanted to do something for a year. And they heard about Hammond and what a great school it was. And, I, and they, they asked me to come over and help them call some plays during a couple of games on Friday nights because when we were in town, I was off. And so I came over for a couple games and called some plays for Phil. Um, and then after that year – um, Phil was like, man, I'm thinking about getting into college. And I was like, well, and this was the year after we got beat by Clemson 63-17. to 17. Okay, it was miserable. Right. We had a meeting at Coach Holtz's house that next day, Sunday. And uh, and we knew that it was not going to be good on Monday. We called it Black Monday. And that's when he fired Googe mm -hmm. and Todd Fitch and uh, Goody. Um, and so anyway, it was it was not a good good Monday. And I've been working about 110 hours a week. And I was like, why am I doing this? So uh, anyway, Phil called and said, hey, man, I'm thinking about getting into college. And I was like, really, man? Because I'm thinking about getting into high school. And uh, he said, well, they want to hire me and Hammond as the head coach. 
He goes, but if you if you left your GA, I might want that job. And I go, well, if you didn't take the job at Hammond, I might want that job. So we essentially switched jobs. Right. And uh, they interviewed me here, and, and luckily they hired me, and I've been here ever since. You talked about Coach Holtz coming in after the locker or in the locker room after a game and kind of being witty but also mean at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Did Did you ever have to like control some laughter when he was screaming? Oh yes! Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, there were some there were some meetings where he would just he maybe stumble over a few of his words. Um, and that sound like him? <laughs> no, it was just like you know he he was so mad he couldn't yeah. he didn't he he didn't he wanted to yell at somebody but he didn't say the right thing. One time he called Michael Ages. We had a receiver from Atlanta, Michael Ages. Michael's smallest dude on the team, 5'10", maybe 175 pounds. And he got so mad at him. He just, Michael Ages, you, you, you fat ass. He called him a fat ass in front of everybody. And all of us were like just biting our fingers like, oh, my God. Coach just called Mike a fat ass. And uh, anyway, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, there were some times where uh, you had to bite your tongue. Were there, was there like a splash zone for spit or anything like that? No, like no, or anything no. like that? You didn't wear no. extra visors? Well, listen, and, you know, Coach had his flaws. Like, I mean, we all do, right? Mm-hmm. But oh, learned yeah. a lot from the guy, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were some things that he did that were, you know, I would question at the time. But then I was like, okay, I, I understand why he did that. Uh, we certainly have different styles. But uh, I still learned a lot from Lou Holtz and appreciate my time with him for sure. Was there, is there one pregame or postgame speech you remember? From Coach Holtz that has just stuck with you for for whether it's whether it was funny or motivational. Did he ever do a motivational no, pregame no, speech? No, he didn't seem like the guy. No, he okay. his pregame speeches were all exactly the same. And I've actually taken that from him. I don't believe that you like that you come. You have some great message, like the greatest like pregame speech in the history of mankind, like your Winston Churchill or something, right? right? And somehow you're going to inspire this like team to play outside of themselves and win a game. That's exactly the opposite of what I want. I want guys that are like keyed in, and they're focused and relaxed. That's why I'm shooting for focused and relaxed. And and how do I keep them kind of in that zone? So there's some games where I will give a more of an impassioned speech. It's usually when we're playing an inferior opponent to try to bring them into that place of focus because I feel like they're too relaxed. There's some games where we're a little bit too focused, like a big game, a championship game, where I might tell jokes before just to get them relaxed. But most of the time, it's the same speech. And he gave the same speech. It's like, hey, guys, remember, momentum's always coming our way. You're a better team. Believe in each other. If you make a great play, great. Let it go. If you make a bad play, let it go. Um, so that was kind of the nature of it. What was the maybe most important thing or the, the most poignant thing that's kind of stuck with you that he taught you over the course of you know y'all's relationship? Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, there was a confidence about him that you trusted that he was going to get the job done. At, le- at least early on there was. And so I think when you feel, when you present yourself as a coach, number one, I mean, hopefully it comes from a place of integrity to where, like, the kids know that you know what you're talking about. And they know that you care about them. And I think that that's a powerful place to be in. And um, I think with Coach Holtz, we knew he was a Hall of Fame coach, and there was a lot of confidence in him that he was going to turn this thing around. So I think that, I, you know, I, that sense of belief in the coach is something that I've learned that you need to have. Now it fell apart a bit. Mm. Over time, and that's something that's even more difficult to do. It's one thing to gain trust; it's another thing to continually keep it. Right. You know, and I think that's why it's hard to stay as same place in coaching for a long time. And you have anything? Good. Um, so, just want to do a quick rapid fire. Just first name that comes to mind. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> best coach we ever had, regardless head coach position. Bill coach. Kimry. <laughs> had to play the, the family card, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was no. I mean, I, I, if you if you measure it on how you learn and how much I learn, it's definitely been my dad. Yeah. And best teammate you've ever had? The best teammate I've ever had. Now Man. you have one that's an AD now. That's kind of like. Yeah, he definitely <laughs> isn't it. Um, no, I'm kidding. Oh man, that's a tough one. I'm trying to think of the best teammate I've ever had at Carolina or in general. In general, yeah. um, I'll, uh, I'll go with I'll go with Philip Jones. He was a center. He was a friend of mine, and just was beat up his whole career. But a guy that just you know continually put it on the line and, and had a positive influence on me. Best, m- most talented. Maybe not best teammate, but just most talented guy you've ever played with or seen. Brian like. Scott. Really? Listen, Brian Scott in high school, he led the state of South Carolina in catches. He was in the top two or three in points per game in basketball, and then like I think he led the state of South Carolina in batting average in the same calendar year. Wow. 
He was a freak, mm-hmm. and uh, he was a, a phenomenal athlete. Favorite memory from Carolina? Uh, favorite memory from Carolina? I mean, probably had to be the fade. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I'm lying. <laughs> Is that your favorite game, too? Um, that was, yeah, I mean, it's up there for mm-hmm. sure. I think that Georgia game that year was great. Both the uh, Ohio State Outback Bowls are great. Alabama 2001 was fantastic. Mm-hmm. What was it like? kind of going off on a tangent but you know Ohio State's obviously one of the blue bloods of, of college football what was it like to beat them not once but in back to back years in kind of the same bowl game um, it was tasty tasty yeah, yeah. <laughs> very tasty no it was great I mean because you know in a bowl game you're with that other team that whole week yeah. like we're at Bush Gardens together you see them and stuff like that and um, you know they had that historic <clears throat> storied program mm-hmm. and geez and when we beat them in the 2002 Outback Al- 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 Bowl they won the national championship the next year um, so yeah, those were those were fantastic wins and 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 a testament to some of the guys we had on the team those couple of years. Yeah, you think about it, Ohio State's never beaten Clemson or South Carolina, ever. Yeah, well, that, thank God we true. haven't played them very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we won't go into yeah, how many times Carolina's played them. Yeah, but sample right. size is small there. Yeah, you, sample you, size you, is yeah. small, but it's worth noting. You know. Yeah. Um, you mentioned those two Outback Bowls. Is there how many of those guys from those teams that you played with? Do you still keep up with? Do you keep contact with most of them? Well, I wouldn't say most of them, but there's the ones that are still here in Columbia for sure. Yeah. Um, so, like, I'm really close friends with Ryan Brewer. He lives down the street from me. Mm-hmm. Of course, Jeff Barnes is here at Hammond with me. Um, Adam Holmes is our snapper. We're friends. He's also a local coach. Some of the guys you keep up with uh, on some group chats and things like that. So. And final question, your best moment from coaching so far? That my best moment from coaching was uh, two years ago when we were flooded here uh, in Columbia, and um, we knew we were going to shut down school for a week. We had a couple people in need, and I sent out a group text to our team. You know, how many of you guys can be at this such and such house at eight in the morning? And like ninety eight percent of my team said they could be there. And then that started six consecutive days of our entire team, including other people within the school, going into about 70 or 80 houses that week. And we didn't touch a football, but it was awesome to watch these kids um, just give up of their time and, and resources and energy to help the community. And um, we kind of I managed that here, and I would take calls, and my wife would help with, uh, you know, who had needs, and we'd try to really reach out to the Hammond community, but other communities as well and go in and help people get their furniture out and rip up floorboards and all the things that we had to do. Um, that's, you know, we didn't touch a football, but that was my most memorable week of coaching. Well, we appreciate you yeah. coming on. Thanks, Thanks for so having me, guys. Yeah, we yeah, good, good, good luck. luck in the playoffs. Yeah. And, uh, so that was Eric Kimry. Um, we appreciate his time. He was a fun interview. We sat down for, what, probably close to 30 minutes with him. Um, and, you know, hopefully his playoff beard that I joked with him about is, is coming back into, into form this week. Uh, getting ready for a big big game coming up. Uh, so now, we, bef- before we wrap up, wanted to touch a little bit on um, South Carolina's next few games. They got Wofford and Clemson. Um, they're already going to a bowl, but uh, with with a win against Wofford, they could be into some warmer weather. Um, if if they beat Wofford, and especially if they beat Clemson, um, they could be going down back where they made their money over the past few years, down to. Uh, down to Florida for a few bowl games. So, Justin, what kind of what your take on where you think South Carolina might end up this postseason? Yeah, well, let, well, let's start with what's most important. With a win over Florida this week, they have uh, relatively talked themselves and worked themselves away from any chance of going down to Birmingham. Um, and I, you know, much respect to the Birmingham Bowl, but you know, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and, as um, a, and as a reporter <laughs> that routinely covers things in. Uh, Hoover for the SEC baseball tournament. Um, not that I don't love Alabama and my job getting to go down there, but uh, varying up from Alabama is always a, a good thing. You never want to get too uh, routine in knowing where different things are along I-20, um, which I've become very accustomed to over the past few years. Right, and so if you're looking at if you're looking at bowl projections, I, I think what's important is it's not just about the team itself; it's about what's going on around it. So the SEC is going to get one team in the in the playoff at least. Maybe two. Maybe two, but probably just one. Um, so that would leave another team to go to an automatic tie-in, which will probably be, um, you know, if we're looking probably at another New Year's Six Bowl, um, which would leave you with probably the Outback Bowl, the Liberty Bowl, the Tax Slayer Bowl. But here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking the Gamecocks are going to end up in the Citrus Bowl um, down in Orlando. Um, they have an SEC-ACC type tie-in, but 
you know, everyone's big on the on the TaxSlayer.com Gator Bowl, but I'm really thinking Citrus Bowl for the Gamecocks against maybe Northwestern, or if Notre Dame were to lose one more game, maybe even the Irish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you know, the Irish aren't obviously, being an independent, aren't tied to one specific bowl. So if right. one conference doesn't, you know, fill one, then they might just slip through the cracks of, you know, an ACC or a Big Ten school that, you know, maybe doesn't quite qualify for it. And, you know, see, the Tax Slayer Bowl is probably – my best bet right now, especially for an eight win South Carolina team. If they get the nine wins, then I definitely see that citrus bowl down in Orlando. Um, but I think that tax layer bowl is kind of eyeing them. They've had reps at, I want to say almost every home game this year. Um, it's, it's somewhere that South Carolina hadn't played in a while. Um, it'd be an easy trip for fans, um, right down 95. Um, and I think that's, that's a, that that's one that, um, they probably get a lot of fans to go to to escape winter in South Carolina and go down to, to Florida for a week after Christmas. Um, and I think you're probably looking at – I think that's an ACC tie-in, uh, and you're probably looking at maybe a Virginia Tech there. Um, mm-hmm. And so my, my family in Virginia would probably be uh, ecstatic about that. Former Gamecock baseball player Tyler Johnson would probably be ecstatic about that, um, being from up there and a big Hokey fan. But – I think right now you're probably looking at the Tax Slayer Bowl, um, if anything. Yeah, which is the old Gator Bowl, mm-hmm. which would be the anniversary of, I believe that would be the first appearance for the Gamecocks in the Gator Bowl since 84, which would be the Black Magic mm-hmm. season, which would be an interesting little storyline here locally, mm-hmm. just for what it's worth. Yeah, um, and then looking ahead now, you got Wofford on Saturday, but they got a South Carolina's got a few other big games. Um, they got Western Michigan Monday tonight uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, and then they, the men's team travels uh, down to Conway for the Puerto Rico uh, tip-off that was relocated to what they consider Myrtle Beach. It's really in Conway. Um, and for games on Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. And then the women obviously take on Maryland um, in a big women's basketball matchup Monday as well. So a lot to look forward to um, this week uh, for South Carolina sports. Uh, it's the fun part of the year where basketball, football are starting up. Baseball's right on the horizon. Um, and it's all going to be covered on Gamecock Central, uh, as always. Um, we got a lot of, we have a great staff that does a lot of great work. Um, and, you know, before we go, Justin, do you have any parting thoughts? Um, in terms of football season, I, I think it's important for fans to get out tonight for this basketball team. Uh, you're going to raise a Final Four banner, something that South Carolina men's basketball has never done before, and I think that's a that's a compelling moment, and that says a lot about what Frank Morton's done. Get out for the basketball team. Support the women's basketball team as they take on Maryland, first big test of the season. Don't overlook Wofford, people. Please don't ask me questions about Clemson this week. Or ask me questions about Clemson. I'll answer. But stick to Wofford. Enjoy one more week because we know this time next week we're going to be knee deep in turkey, cranberry sauce, and Carolina Clemson trash talk. Mm-hmm. And it should be a lot of fun. Um, if as always, keep it locked to Gamecock Central through the week for football, basketball, all kinds of coverage. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Colin C O L L Y N Taylor T A Y L O R. All smushed together. Um, Justin, you want to throw out your Twitter handle before we? Yeah, uh, Justin B. Hall, all smushed together, but the J, the B, and the H are capitalized. So you can follow me there all week long. I, I, I don't tweet anything other than really sports stuff. That's about all I talk about. Yeah, and my specialties are food, 2000s hip hop, and sports. So there you go. You're, You're getting... much more well rounded than I yeah. am. <laughs> I'm the complete Twitter page. Um, <laughs> so, and obviously follow Gamecock Central social media as well. Um, that's our show. We hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any other um, hate mail, fan mail, anything like that, you just heard our Twitter accounts. Um, Gamecock Central has a lovely message board that we would like to hear from you on. Um, Absolutely. And you know, I'm not above a shameless plug here or there. Uh, yeah. And hit subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Do it, yeah. do it, do it. <laughs> um, unsubscribe and subscribe again. Who cares? Yeah, whatever. Uh, and so you know, let us know what you think um, and who you might want to hear uh or who you would like for us to interview over the next few days or weeks or months. Um, We hope to keep this going for a pretty long time. 
Um, and with that, we'd like to say goodbye and talk to you guys next week.